Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Dvorkin uh, from the uh, Air and Space Museum uh, Smithsonian uh, be here with us today. He's a senior curator uh, of the history of astronomy and uh, the study of astrophysics. And my goodness, he's written many, many books and articles over the years. He's, he's a wealth of information and has uh, great expertise. So we're not going to see the moon tonight, but we're definitely going to hear about it. That's, that's as good as I can do for you right now. <laughs> okay, so um, it's a pleasure to have you, sir, and I will turn the floor over to you. Well, Thank delighted. You. Really happy to be here, happy to be asked, and I'm telling you, the first two talks were just really terrific. You do attract some really first-class uh, presenters, and I think I learned more about uh, Pluto and, uh, and uh, certainly uh, about, other, about the sun uh, really, really very helpful. But I'm going to take you on a historical trip. And uh, I, I'm going to be talking about a very interesting uh, episode that is not too well remembered in uh, the preparations for um, going to the moon and landing on the moon. And I'm calling it Fall of Moon Dust, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, as we know, uh, when uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, planted his foot on the moon and then, of course, photographed it. Uh, he, he did document his actions very, very uh, completely. Um, it really did answer some very, very long-term questions. Some, there was a real debate over what was the surface of the moon like. Uh, was it in deep dust so that we were, you know, if we landed, we would sink? Anybody remember that? Yeah, okay. You also remember that we did go to the moon, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, good, 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 good. Okay, well, that's very important, very helpful. <laughs> but there was this uh, very, very brilliant and creative uh, uh, fellow, uh, Tom Gold. Uh, he was uh, part of a trio of very bright people. Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and Tom Gold, they were the three wild men of uh, astronomy, cosmology, everything, starting in the late 1930s and going well through into the 50s and 60s. Um, they were, um, sociologists are still fascinated with them. They're calling them foxes. Uh, they were the kinds of scientists who would pick out the most interesting tidbits and then drive people wild with their speculations about them. Tom did that on many occasions, and most of his stuff strikes pay dirt. Uh, but there was one in the mid-50s where he became fascinated with uh, what is the lunar surface like? And people were speculating about traveling to the moon, uh, and he, of course, worried what would happen if they landed there and sank. Okay, so uh, his work in the mid-50s did attract a lot of popular attention. If you look carefully, this is a book by Arthur Clarke. Anybody read it, Fall of Moon Dust? Oh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, you'll notice that he has some sort of a, a boat-like uh, object with big outriggers on it that is skimming this huge dust layer on the moon, and that's how he thought you would get around the moon. Of course, it was a bit of a farce all the way around. It was really a great story. But the question was, as we dream about the moon, what is the moon really about? And so I want to give you a little bit of history uh, along those lines and then bring you up to, uh, to the time when, of course, we already have the answer, what it's like. But how did we have that answer? We did have that answer starting in the late 1940s. But then Tom, in the mid-50s, made such a big deal of it, it became a deep, deep question, is how deep is the lunar dust layer? Naturally, since we started thinking about going to the moon, okay, what, where did this come from? Come on. Well, yes, but what, what film? Destination Moon. And I bring that up only because uh, we are new. Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And I'm telling you, um, uh, our, we have renamed our Apollo gallery, Destination Moon. And it will open in a few years, and it will be a trip. 
Okay? You will not doubt that we went to the moon after you come out of that gallery. All right. But anyway, was the moon lava, uh, a volcanic uh, um, here, or was it something else? Now, that, that relates to some very deep questions about the origins of lunar features, and I want you to keep that in mind. In other words, you know, you see all those craters. Are they volcanoes? Now, we might think that's a little bit silly today, but when I was at Yerkes Observatory working there as a observing grunt, uh, I, I ran the 40-inch telescope for whoever wanted to use it, uh, plus myself. Um, uh, Brian Warner, a very fine uh, astronomer, uh, came in with a case of six-pack of beer, and uh, he took a night looking visually at lunar peaks, looking for caldera. At, you know, beyond the, the uh, you know, this is way before uh, adaptive optics and going, you know, going into space and everything, still wondering, are there volcanoes on the moon? So it was a big, it was a deep question. Now, uh, just to make a point, by 1964, which was almost nine years after Tom Gold, it's very, very clear that uh, in, in, in the popular literature, at least, uh, his prognostications were still being debated. The dust has yet to settle in the arguments over the nature of the moon's surface. Is it covered with dust deep enough to swallow a landing vehicle? Or is it essentially firm and rock-like? The point was hotly debated by space scientists pr prior to Ranger. And, you know, we know once the Rangers started landing, we had a much better idea. But even then, it's still being debated after the Ranger, which surprised me. Um, Shoemaker and Kuiper, of course, uh, did conclude that, yes, there is a dust layer there, but it is, it is quite thin. Uh, but Tom Gold, apparently, is stating, uh, writing in Science, the Ranger pictures have clearly strengthened the case for dust being the main constituent of the lunar lowlands. Without any clear signs of firm rock, the pictures must lead to more concern about sinkage on, or on impact or dust blowing and rocket exhaust in future operations on the lunar surface. So, it, you know, it's just, he kept it going. Now, what fascinates me about Tom Gold is that uh, when he was interviewed in 1978, well after all of this, uh, and he was interviewed by the uh, um, uh, uh, historian Spencer Wirt at the American Institute of Physics, and that's where I worked in the late 70s learning how to be a historian. And uh, uh, Spencer interviewed Gold, and this is what Gold said about the whole thing. Quote, then the newspaper people did a very unfortunate thing for me. Now, think about contemporary times here. They picked on the aspect that they thought they understood. Namely, they thought that if it was a deep deposit of powder, powder then automatically meant that you would sink in it and disappear. Now, he claims, at least to Spencer and to others, that he never said that. And so it is still, I think, the historian's job to clarify what did he really say, what did he really think, and how did people uh, react to it, and especially did the, um, did the uh, press, the media, inflate it? And this is an un unanswered question, and I'm trying to convince some young historians to get, get interested in it. Uh, but... I'd like, I bring it up because uh, it's, it, it, is in it is very closely linked to this question of the origin of the lunar surface. Was it lava? Are those mare, big seas of lava, which is what I thought when I was a kid, or are they dust fields? And so let's sort of step back a little bit into history to uh, just look very briefly at how we learned about the moon and the kinds of questions we asked about it. Of course, we start with Galileo. And for my two cents, um, Galileo was the first to look at the moon as a physical body and argued about its features, thinking about them as in terms of terrestrial features. He made astronomy physical at that point with his observations. 
His observations were, of course, uh, elaborated by others like Hevelius. Uh, yeah, but Hevelius, and ad- many did at that time, also added speculation that the moon is inhabited because it, given the doctrine of the plurality of worlds, everything God made had to be inhabited in or- order to have a purpose. Uh, and and it also has seas. And so this, this in fact, was a book, uh, early expression of this concept of plur- plurality. So here it is, an Earth-like body. Uh, in, um, in, in, by the late 18th century, uh, in uh, late, late Herschel's day and into the uh, uh, 1800s, there were many, many controversial things about plurality, uh, which people would spoof. And there was one wonderful spoof that uh, uh, used uh, the 20-foot Herschel reflector that we display at the museum. Anybody see it? Has anybody seen it? Well, the rest of you should go see it, okay? It's the original Herschel 20-foot reflector that he and his sister used for stargazing to assess observationally the structure of the universe as they understood it at that time. But uh, after Herschel died, his son took the telescope to continue the the gauging uh, to South Africa. And during that time, in the 1840s, well, after William was gone, uh, there was an intrepid uh, uh, reporter who claimed to have been getting these letters from Herschel about uh, all of the creatures that he was observing on the moon. And, And this was nothing but a spoof on plurality, but everybody believed it. Okay, well, here we go, you know. Now, what about actually studying the moon as a physical body? Um, Samuel Pierpont Langley was one of the first to develop uh, what we call a bolometer, which is a very sophisticated, very sensitive thermometer, where you have um, a metallic surfaces here exposed to radiation, and the exposure changes in the slightest way its resistivity. And that resistivity can be amplified in various ways to be recorded. And uh, Langley's bolometer was so sensitive that it supposedly could sense the heat of a cow at 400 yards. Okay? Now, some people say that's no big deal. Okay, but it was a good start. And he used it to study the lunar surface because the big question of what is the moon, are those things really seas, is how do they react to sunlight? Do they warm quickly, cool quickly, uh, or are they relatively insensitive? And given all of those um, uh, kinds of observations, one could figure out uh, what the uh, lunar surface is all about. Langley started it, but it was expanded greatly uh, by the fourth Earl of Ross. And you know, the third Earl was the one who built the Leviathan of Parsonstown, the uh, six-foot reflector, uh, that with uh, which he, um, d- his, his assistants, of course, discovered spiral nebulae and started the ball rolling as to saying, Where the, what the heck are those things? Uh, and, but they kept on going, building smaller and more sophisticated telescopes in, in the late 19th century uh, that included what were called radiometers, which were bolometers uh, with, uh, attached to, to telescopes. Uh, I was uh, privileged to uh, make an official visit to the uh, um, uh, uh, Leviathan, um, oops, sorry, several years ago, mainly uh, to see if we could trade off um, uh, instruments from the Apollo era, because he had, this is the eighth Earl of Ross. Let's see, make sure I hit the right one. Yeah, this guy here. Um, and they were interested in cooperating with the Smithsonian. So I got, I, I got a boondoggle to go out there and uh, examine some of the instruments that, uh, that, that uh, they have preserved, which is really, really, was, was, was a great thing. The thing that impressed me most was um, there was a program that they uh, developed, the Rosses, in the 1890s um, to, um, to be able to, oops, to be able to assess, well, okay, we can use this, to be able to assess the change in temperature of the lunar surface during a lunar eclipse. Because there you have all of the processes happening really fast, and you could see how the surface is. 
Now, they started with the big telescopes, but that didn't work because they realized, given it's being Ireland, of course, that the atmospherics were terrible. So then what the Rosses did was they had 20 small radiometers built and sent them all over Europe and all over uh, the British Isles to make simultaneous observations to get rid of the, the uh, t um, atmospheric effects to looking, looking at the differences. That's just like, you know, that's like a 19th century event horizon telescope. And you've heard of that one. We're getting a piece of it, by the way, and I can talk about that later. Okay. Um, so these are, uh, this idea, this, this use of radiometry to examine the lunar surface uh, was really, really uh, quite a popular and important uh, piece of work. Uh, so much so that even with the 100-inch telescope, uh, radiometry was one of the goals of it. Uh, putting a thermocouple at the Newtonian focus uh, to examine the moon during a lunar eclipse. Edison Pettit uh, developed this thermocouple that was maybe 10,000, 20,000 times more sensitive than, than Langley's. I uh, can't quite read this, um, uh, but it's the finest and most sensitive ever constructed in any laboratory for any purpose. Well, that, that's, you know, that's, that's the media. Don't you love it? Uh, but it is quite true that uh, it could detect a cow at the distance of the moon. So we're talking very sensitive. And he then started um, observing the moon during whenever lunar eclipses were available and uh, um, uh, finding by the late 1930s that the uh, nature of the of, of the cooling curves uh, from lunar eclipses uh, was was actually really quite consistent and they had some really good data now excellent astronomers at Mount Wilson and elsewhere but they didn't know what to do with the data they weren't they weren't physicists as we think of them of astronomers today uh, they, they were they were good instrument builders great observers and they dealt in an era where everything was sort of a correlation they would correlate different phys physical observations and try to see in the correlations what's happening rather than going to the physics of the substance itself now that started changing after World War II and it started changing uh, along with many, many astronomers, but it started changing really first in Europe, more quickly than in the United States. One of the reasons was that all the big telescopes are in the United States, and so if you were a really competitive astronomer, you would find things to do with those telescopes. You wouldn't necessarily stand back and think, well, um, what do I do with this telescope? Uh, in terms of physical processes and everything. Uh, you had a telescope, you had to use it, and so you mapped the heavens, you mapped the universe. The Europeans didn't have a telescope. Here, this is uh, young Adrian Jan Wesselink. He was a student of Jan Oort's uh, in Leiden. And uh, he was uh, also a student of uh, Hertzsprung's uh, in Leiden. And Hertzsprung, you know the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Yeah. Hertzsprung was the one who took all the data and thought in terms of magnificent correlations, and he was really, really quite brilliant. But it was really quite evident that you had to think about uh, what kind of physical questions are you asking about the things that are radiating that radiation that you are trying to map and record. And uh, Adrian Westlink was of that um, persuasion, except that uh, he was, uh, uh, as a junior uh, d uh, astronomer at Leiden, uh, required to simply uh, work on uh, analyzing data and um, uh, the data that was taken at observatories around the world and at the Leiden Observatory itself. But then in World War II, uh, something happened. He lost access to that data, as did most uh, people in Holland, and he also lost access uh, to the observatory because there wasn't any heat, and they also had to hide for reasons I don't uh, have to get into. And uh, in his own oral histories that I took of him, uh, he and many of his, his colleagues at that time 
uh, realized that in this, the nature of, uh, of the world at the time, it was safer for them to delve in physical theory than it was to go to the telescope. And so they started thinking in terms of physical problems to solve. And he became attracted to uh, the um, problem of the lunar heat uh, uh, as observed in detail by um, uh, uh, Edison Pettit and by others and decided to uh, do a much better job than it had been done uh, in the past um, w with the data. He did not have access to the telescopes or to the instruments, but he had the published data. Um, so uh, w during my interview with him, and this was back in 1977, so it was a while ago, uh, he said, I decided in the midst of the war that I should do some work in more theater theoretical directions. And I want to be able to read this. I don't get it right. Okay. Um, I first asked him, why did he become interested in the lunar surface? Um, he recalled that there were other students who were also interested in the lunar surface problem and in the nature of the lunar surface, and they were using Pettit's observations. And during a seminar, he, he uh, Westlink, um, and I knew him pretty well, he was my thesis advisor uh, when I was still in astronomy, um, uh, he made a few snarky comments about uh, somebody else's work. You can think in a student seminar, you want to stand out, so you make snarky comments. No less than Jan Oort. Now, we've heard about the Kuiper Belt. Ever hear of the Oort cloud? Okay, that's the Oort we're talking about. Um, turns back to Wesleyan and say, okay, smarty pants, you do better. Okay, and that's exactly what he did. Um, in his work, he analyzed Pettit's observations uh, using physical heat theory and um, uh, using also a vast amount of laboratory data that has, was available on uh, the specific heats of different substances and came up with a model for the surface of the moon uh, that indicated that indeed it was a dust layer, but the dust was maybe few centimeters thick, not much thicker than that. And then below that, it became viscous. Now, what caused that dust layer was a key. Uh, and his argument was cosmic rays, cosmic ray bombardment on the, um, on the moon over the eons uh, could turn this material into uh, a, a dust kind of material. But where the dust came from, he didn't know. He didn't ask that question because everybody was still thinking, well, it's probably lava. It came from volcanoes, um, so on and so forth, and, and then disintegrated over the eons. So that's pretty much where it stood. I did a study of the number of citations to his papers from the 1940s just to see, well, was, it, were, were, was his work forgotten? And indeed it was not because here, here's his paper here, there's some initial citations, and then a big, big jump in citations here and it continues on to this day to a cer certain extent. This is not hugely cited, but uh, these, are, um, these are refereed citations in the technical literature. Well, it was this period that interested me most because what Westlink was arguing in his model was that, yes, there's a dust layer, but it isn't very thick. Whereas it, this was the time that Tom Gold was coming on saying if it was so thick, you know, it's so thick, you're going to sink. Well, okay, we are now uh, in that uh, period where we finally landed on the moon. And let's see, I have here, yes, I, when I interviewed him, I asked him how did he feel watching uh, the Apollo 11 moon landing, you know, on, on TV. And uh, he said, well, I was, of course, witnessing Aldrin descending on the moon in 1969, the first man on the moon. I saw it on TV. He came down from the steps out of the capsule and put his foot down on the lunar surface and left an imprint in the dust layer. And there was no question in my mind, 
That proved my point. Aldrin didn't sink. So there was really dust on the moon, and uh, it was really uh, quite a, I think, a, a feather in his cap. Did he do anything about it? Nope. He was just going on with, yes. Was there actually any measurement of the depth of the dust where they were working? Oh, where Aldrin, oh yeah, well, it was... Uh, not in Apollo 11, in the later ones, uh, but it, it never went down more than a few centimeters, but then it turned into a, a viscous material and it became compacted. Like honey? Mm, it wouldn't flow. <laughs> what do you mean by viscous? Um, it, it did have a rubbery, it had, had a rubbery texture to it, but that's because it was static charge. It was all held together by static charge. And that, uh, you're, you're anticipating my talk, okay. <laughs> this is the guy I, I'm really going to talk about, and he's the one who figured that out. This is Fred Whipple, and uh, I wrote a, a book recently that came out in 2018 about Whipple, and I'll, it's a free ebook, and there's a, I'll give you a citation at the end of the, of the talk. Uh, but he uh, was, of course, the founder, as we know it today, of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And that's what the book is really about. In his creation of this huge, huge organization, uh, there was a period when he, he began it in the mid-50s. I'm not going to go through his publishing history. But in 1959, when he became absolutely fascinated with, uh, from his studies of meteorites and the effect of cosmic rays on uh, 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 erosion rates of meteorites, because uh, he could age date them, um, he became interested in the lunar surface and the nature of it. And of course, this was also in reaction to uh, Tom Gold and, 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 and uh, arguments like that. He built at the Smithsonian Astrophysical a new kind of observatory. He had always, because he was very much affected by Harlow Shapley, the director at Harvard for many, many years, uh, and Shapley was very much an advocate for interdisciplinarity e ever since the 1930s. Whipple, who had always been interested in meteoritics, got very interested in, whoops, well, let's not worry about that, uh, what we would call uh, geophysics. And you may know him as the uh, dirty snowball man. Yeah, the dirty snowball. Comets were made out of dirty snowballs. That's mainly ice with a little bit of uh, dust and goop in it. And that stuff would evaporate and spread as the comet heated as it moved toward the sun. That was his model for the sun. And he determined this uh, through a long uh, process of examining how different types of meteor swarms evaporated in our atmosphere, finding that the Geminids evaporated much higher than others, and knowing that the Geminids came from cometary material, realized that the comets had to be very, very loosely constructed ice balls, whereas others, like the Leonids, uh, evaporated in lower in the atmosphere, and so they were irons and rocky. So it, it, it's a very interesting part of solar system history. But Fred got very, very interested in meteors and the lunar surface, getting a better sense of what is the moon, what are the origins of the lunar features, so on and so forth. He did not believe in volcanism. He believed it was meteor impact, meteoritic impact. And that was a big debate throughout uh, astronomy in the 50s and early 60s. So, as he built the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory into the largest observatory in the world, he also added to it uh, areas that weren't traditionally part of an observatory, uh, like um, uh, uh, geodesy and geophysics and aeronomy and subjects like that. Now, ironically, if you go back and look at observatories like Greenwich and others and the Paris Observatory back in the mid-19th century, they 
included some of these other subjects too. But the rise of professionalism in astronomy also caused astronomy to have to um, focus on things that it was unique at doing. And so it dropped all those other things. But Whipple wanted to revise it, revive it. And here we see firemen, uh, John Wood, Ur uh, Ursula Marvin, and these groups of geophysicists, uh, meteoritic types, chemists, and getting together in, uh, in laboratories uh, to examine uh, first meteor meteoritic composition and then lunar composition. Ursula Marvin was the one who did it. And she was a geophysicist, geochemist, geo-everything you can imagine, but she was also a team builder. And she put together groups uh, in different laboratories between MIT, Harvard, Smithsonian, got them together to all think about what, if we eventually get to the moon, and this is the early 60s, what, how do we prepare ourselves to, an, uh, to, 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 to analyze uh, the information that we get? Here's a great picture of her in, in Antarctica finding a, uh, a uh, meteoritic stone. You know that if you're traveling through Antarctica and you see a stone on the top of, an, of a glacier, it's got to be extraterrestrial. And much of the substances we've collected uh, uh, have come from that kind of, of, of examination. She also, along with Wood, started classifying in, in what we would call a cosmochemist uh, type uh, framework uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, these different types of rocks getting better ideas of how they, they, they originate. Where do they come from? Uh, what kinds of processes have changed them over time? And here, here they are with their microscope and their laboratory. Now, John Wood and Ursula, neither of them were senior scientists uh, during the mid-60s yet uh, as Apollo was forming. And of course, with the prospect of bringing moon rocks back, uh, you can imagine that everybody was going to want to try to get their hands on some of it and analyze it. And then the question was, in the professional disciplines, who had the most clout? Whoever had the most clout would probably get the biggest and nicest rocks, right? Okay, work with that for a second. This is John, quoted in 2012. Most of the people that were involved in setting up the lunar science program had not come from the meteorite community. He was part of the meteorite community, as was Ursula. But they were kind of like outsiders. I mean, who's interested in meteorites uh, if, you're if you're a straight hard rock geologist, okay? At the time. It's not that way anymore, but that's the way it was at that time. They were workers in the terrestrial geosciences, a very different population from cosmochemists. They didn't know about and would not have been impressed by my background. That would be John Wood's background. The people they respected were those that had made reputations in terrestrial meteorology. So I assumed correctly that we would be at the bottom of the totem pole for getting access to lunar rocks. Um, I don't believe him. Uh, because, first of all, he worked for Fred Whipple, and Fred Whipple was one of the most influential names in, in science at the time. And even more important, Whipple knew that the key to the fundamental answers that were to come back from, uh, from the lunar samples were not in the rocks, but it was in the soil, the, the dust. And... Um, Wood and Ursula Marvin elected to um, have samples of lunar dust, and they got quite a bit of it. And out of that dust, they found both the basaltic, the dark stuff, and the light stuff, uh, the anorth anorthosites, uh, from the Apollo 11 soil. And the anorthosites, I can't pronounce them, of course, um, were uh, indica indicative of, uh, when you looked at them microscopically, they had a crystal structure that indicated impact in their histories. 
high rates of impact. What did that mean? Well, you don't get impact in a volcano. You get impact from a big asteroid collision or a meteor collision and that sort of thing. And even more than that, their composition was such that they were not indicative of the lunar surface. They were in, it, they implied or directed composition of the lunar interior. These impacts were so big, think of it, you know, an asteroid hitting the moon, and it will crack whatever the moon is, uh, you know, has, if it has a crust, and, and well up deep, from deep inside the moon, a lot of material that spreads over the surface of the moon all over the place, and is also vaporized at the same time, and that is the lunar regolith. That was the interpretation. So from this kind of work, John Wood and his, his crew de decided the lunar, the lunar structure must have an interior semi-liquid state. In other words, it has a mantle, just like the Earth. And more importantly, that it is the debris from impact studies, not volcano. So f those were the two almost immediate results from the lunar uh, surface that uh, came uh, came back and came out of John Wood's work. What we found were actually tiny fragments of rock which were sufficiently fine-grained for all of them to be polycrystalline, polymineralic, in other words, many minerals, many types of crystal structures, and fairly representative of the rock had been broken from. So they knew that they were looking at samples of things that had been big rocks, but through impact had been vaporized to dust. The terrestrial geologists, then he said with a snicker, uh, thought it was their first duty to understand the basalts because they were all looking for volcanic processes. But it wasn't the basalts. And uh, so he was, the Smithsonian group was one of the only groups looking at the, the, the non-basalts and that's where they found the key to the origin and the evolution of the lunar surface and of the interior of the moon. Here's a uh, sense of what it was they were playing with, having fun. So, indeed, you know, if you want to touch a piece of the moon, uh, you can come to the National Air and Space Museum and put your finger on a, on a little lunar swath, and that's all very nice. But it wasn't from those kinds of samples that we really, really understood what the moon was, where it came from, uh, that sort of thing. Now, today, uh, we are still hearing about revelations about the early history of the moon. You know what the latest one is, that the impact between a Mars-sized body and the proto-whatever the Earth had been took place earlier when the Earth was still molten. And that helps you understand the compositional differences between the Earth and Moon in terms of uh, uh, what, re, uh, what got, got reorganized in the, in, in the resulting debris field uh, that f the f Earth and Moon finally formed out of. But it doesn't change the basic model that uh, John Wood and Ursula Marvin developed. And so, so far, uh, the, uh, the story continues. But still, please, come to the museum, touch the moon, and, uh, and enjoy. So thanks for listening. <laughs> so as I promised, um, part of this moon dust story is part of the uh, book that I wrote that's titled Fred Whipple's Empire, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, 1955 to 1972. It's a free ebook. All you have to do is in Google, put Fred Whipple's Empire, and it'll, it'll come right up. It's, a, it's an open SI book, and it's available there. So I, uh, I would love to have you read it and ask me any nasty questions you want sometime. Questions, yeah. Um, it was really the, the cosmic ray uh, bombard. Bo oh yes. Uh, what was Tom Tom Gold's um, argument for the deep dust? It was twofold, actually. His interpretation of Pettit's data, uh, and he did not believe in the in the in in the. Um, 
Well, see, this is the problem. Tom Gold now says, uh, or did say after the fact, that um, he was mis misunderstood. And y you wouldn't sink. But the trouble is he did say you would sink. And I think that what we're looking at is a personality thing here. He wanted attention. And he got it. Okay? But his argument was compaction and, uh, and, and the static... Um, the static cohesion. Is it cohesion? Yeah, cohesion. Yeah. And another question. The other one is, um, my advisor came from the Caltech Hard Rock Geology School of Early Lunar People. Oh. There's lots of money floating around. Wh wh when was this, uh, 1940, 30? <laughs> 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 my advisor was, was one of Jim Westfall's. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I know the name, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but it was in a different way. They already had the infrastructure. Uh, Frondell and, uh, and Fireman and others already had laboratories. And it was really just uh, the problem of getting the expertise together and thinking uh, creatively about what's important. Good, but it's a good question, good point. Um, I don't know how large their grant proposals were, but they certainly were supported by, by uh, different NASA grants. Uh huh. Funded by by uh, uh, but w made given access to the lunar samples was the big key. H uh, where did where did they fit? Yeah. Oh. Well, that's no that makes a good point. The Smithsonian had uh, uh, deeper in the history, and it's in the book. Um, the big problem with the Smithsonian was that SAO was in competition with Natural History, and because the Natural History Museum had um, uh, Henderson and others who were had been collecting meteor uh, samples for ages, and felt that was the only proper place to collect objects, because the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, bureaucratically, wasn't a museum. And it, it, it got really sticky in the 50s and 60s. So that was where their, their main thing was. So what, the, what Ripley did and others um, uh, was to create a third group that was a hybrid of both SAO and natural history uh, that was responsible for retrieval, fast retrieval. And the whole key was in fast retrieval. You know, if, if a meteorite hits the earth, it's immediately contaminated. And the longer uh, it takes to, to find it and isolate it and analyze it, the more the problem with contamination. So they had this very rapid response group that, um, that uh, reacted to, uh, and they worked with the Air Force uh, to Allende and everything. So, you know, in fact, no, that makes me think there was a lot of Air Force funding for the, for the sample stuff because it was rapid reaction global. Um, but it's an interesting story, which I don't... I don't think I have the complete answer for as far as funding is concerned. But nobody was worried about funding at that time. You're certainly right. Yes? Uh, you said you would explain about the uh, viscosity and electrostatic characteristics of the Did I say I'd explain it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember saying I'd explain it. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that it tends to be uh, stochastic, like uh, Barton Sands and structural mixotropes. 
in every direction, equal, well, no, random. That Yeah. Whereas if you press on a stack of uh, uh, sand, that's that's the type that's known as barking sand, you know, hmm. where, it, where it rubs against itself and actually develops resonances. Okay. That's way beyond my my grade level, but <laughs> but <laughs> still, yeah. So the, uh, a, a, a static uh, uh, dust, like uh, they use sometimes in uh, electrostatic printers or laser printers. Uh huh. Okay. And yeah. Is that the sort of viscosity that you're talking about? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> so why do you call it viscous? Because that's the word that Whipple used, and th they all used viscosity. So what kind of forces? Are, I mean, it, is I it like mud or like uh, uh, glass is viscous or? Don't know. I mean, you you. It's it's a good question, I'm sure, but it's certainly beyond my. Uh, comprehension at this point. I am only taking what how the characters referred to it, and they use the term viscosity. Yeah. Uh, were they concerned that the viscosity might affect the stability of a spacecraft on the surface? Or yeah. Well, th that's what Tom Gold started worrying about. You got everybody worrying about. With the yeah. theory that the, uh, the, under, the, the material underlying the surface dust as opposed to it being deep Okay, I thought there were two different theories. One that the d dust was thin on top of right. The that's West Link. That's right. That it was thick and uh, just a dust all the way down. To that's my understanding, but uh, 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 my my understanding is qualitative. Completely. Okay. Yeah. So, by the time we launched the first Apollo missions, um, were the people running the Apollo missions concerned about what they were going to find on the surface, or was it just the unwashed masses outside who were concerned? Take a look at the size of the landing pads on the LEM. Okay. That's my answer. Yeah. Surveyor is a very good, I mean, one would have thought, but that didn't convince everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was different parts of the lunar land, uh, uh, area and stuff. I mean, it's just really an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take a chance. If there's the slightest chance, account for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why they made them as big as they are. And how, bi how big are they? I thought they were like a foot or two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, might they have put a, 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 like a trampoline surface? Oh, I, I don't know. All I can say is <laughs> even though it's sixth gravity, you know, they were taking no chances. <laughs> I think the less gravity, the worse it might be. Really? Sure. The dust would be less compacted. Well, a oh, good point. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if you go back to 1946, you will find, and there's a historian working on this right now, great excitement for in, in certain circles, military circles, for impacting the moon. I was. Uh, we all kind of knew this. There was that there was a little bit of effort this way. But they were, they were such technological or engineering enthusiasts that they figured with the rocketry as it was in 1947-48, they could be on the moon in 51-52. Okay? 
uh, I think what we're seeing now is a resurgence of that kind of mindset for political reasons. He was not part of this particular group that um, uh, was in the Air Force. I mean, he was all Army and everything. And I don't, kn I don't recall his um, thinking in terms of actual dates. If you go back and look at the Collier series and some of the other popular stuff that Whipple and, and uh, Von Braun and Willie Lay were doing, uh, they didn't put a year on it. They said, we have to work toward this goal. Uh, I mean, Von Braun's um, uh, whole Mars thing in the early 50s, you know, was marvelous, but he did not give a date. Well, the Air Force was setting a date, and this was at that time their MX series that uh, was not even, inter not even intercontinental at that time. So it was really, really a stretch. Now, anybody today, given the present state of, of NASA, and uh, in our abilities and our priorities that says we're going to be there by 2024 is that right is that what he's still saying yeah you know now saying all of that i say sure i'd like to be wrong <laughs> well thank you very much